This week, we welcome Nemi George, Vice President, IT Infrastructure and Operations, Information Security Officer at Pacific Dental Services, to discuss how network detection and response solves complex cybersecurity challenges. In the Leadership and Communication section, Being a CISO in 2021, How to Be a Business Leader in the Boardroom, Skills CISOs Need to Have in 2021, Build Your Cybersecurity A Team, Seven Recruiting Tips, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Week. Stopping advanced threats requires knowing exactly what you're up against. Extra Hop Reveal X is the only solution that shows you not just where intruders are going, but where they've been. 90 day look back and complete network visibility across the data center, cloud, and device edge help security teams respond 84% faster with Extra Hop Reveal X network detection and response. Explore the interactive demo at securityweekly.com forward slash extra hop. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 211, recorded March 29th, 2021. I am your host, Matt Alderman, back here in Colorado after a quick, quick spring break trip to South Carolina. Joining me from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island are my two co-hosts, Mr. Paul Asadorian and Mr. Jason Albuquerque. We missed you, Matt. We did. Missed you last week, Matt. Good to have you back. Matt, free Monday. We didn't like it. (laughs) Matt, free Monday. (laughs) Well, it, it was a successful trip in that Brendan finally figured out where he's going to college. Yeah. So that's good. It, that's all awesome. the campus visits are now over. The, he's all enrolled. He's ready to go. So my my baby is is uh, will be off in the fall. Congratulations, he's going to Texas Tech, everybody. So that's great. That's where he ended up. Yeah. Do you want to stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly? Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. To subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher or your our YouTube channel, sign up for our mailing list and join our Discord server. Well, I also added our uh, link to Twitch, which is also where we're doing some live streaming as well, so you can also uh, get to Twitch as well. If you missed Security Weekly Unlocked, you can now access all the content on demand, whether you register before the live event or not, by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked and clicking either the button to register or the button to log in. This segment is sponsored by ExtraHop. Nemi George is currently Vice President, IT Infrastructure and Operations, Information Security Officer at Pacific Dental Services, a national dental support organization. Prior to PDS, Nemi worked with Vodafone Global Enterprise for over nine years and a number of roles across architecture, information security, managed service operations, and compliance security and risk, and was responsible for managing Vodafone's global enterprise operations and managed mobility business verticals, leading teams across across Europe, the U.S., and India. Welcome, uh, Nemi, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thank you for having me, Paul. Appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. So we're going to talk about your environment, and we're going to talk about how Extra Hop and network detection and response is helping you. But before we kind of get into the specifics, give us a little background on Pacific Dental Services and a, a little overview of kind of your architecture and infrastructure, because you're a pretty big organization, I think. Yeah, um, we are a pretty large organization. We, um, we first of all, I guess, let me start with explaining what we do. So we are a dental um, service organization, meaning we provide um, all manner of IT infrastructure, application, business services to, to dental offices. We currently have about 830 supported dental offices in 23 different states. And we are essentially everything behind the scenes and we enable a dentist to walk into one of our practices and do dentistry. So within that, um, as you can imagine, everything from the practice management system to um, the clinical technology, the endpoints, um, all the assets within the dental office, all of that is managed uh, by by us and, and by my team. So we are largely um, cloud first, uh, mobile first, and we also have a, a, a large on-prem um, slash hybrid environment across all the different cloud providers 
and we pretty much play in all of those spaces. In, in Nemi, uh, dental, in, <coughs> excuse me, dental and health records are mm. very much the same thing, right? So HIPAA is a, a big compliance uh, regime for you. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's in, in our world, there's really no, no difference. It's your your personal identifiable information, and then added to that, you know, your the rest of your healthcare records. Mm. Mm. And you know, one of the things that PDS is uh, Pacific Dental Services is known for is really championing this concept of the mouth body connection. Right. Certainly in the U.S., there seems to be a bit of a disjoint between dentistry and the rest of medical. But mm -hmm. when you think about it, when you go into a dental office and you go through your health history and all of that, it's all about your health. It's mm -hmm. all about your information. And from a data standpoint, there's really no split in your health records from your dental records. It's one and the same thing. So we have right. to protect it um, like any other hospital yeah. would the data that they hold yeah because they always ask me if i smoke <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you want to know what though I'm, I'm starting to see in the industry a lot of convergence of these healthcare organizations mm -hmm. i recently went to the eye doctor it was the same thing like they they they, they did an eye checkup on me and they said you want to know what there's indicating factors yes. in your eyes that can lead same that thing can, with your that teeth can, and your right? mouth yep, yep so so we're starting to see kind of that convergence of all these different mm -hmm. verticals within healthcare Absolutely. And, and obviously, we just went through, you know, a, a big shift in work from home. I, I know, mm. like, for me, I, I couldn't even get a dentist appointment until recently because oh, it yeah. was so yeah, hard right. to get into a dentist office. But what did that also do when you, when you think about supporting all these offices? How did the pandemic and, and a lot of this shift to work from home impact your business and, and the way you had to help manage infrastructure? I think that the first thing I would say there, Paul, is that uh, nothing changed drastically other than reinforcing a lot of the, the controls and the best practices that we had in place for for people working remotely. Now, I will say that we never expected a, you know it to scale this quickly and obviously this much uh, with, with the impact of COVID. But a lot of those basics, right, in, that we had we had in place, uh, remote working using uh, VPN, having uh, VDI for most of our applications, the ability to use um, SaaS applications as we move more to the cloud, enabled the transition to work from home to be a lot a lot more seamless than most people uh, would have experienced. I would imagine if if this had happened, say, ten years ago, mm. when the adoption of cloud services and, and applications were not consumed as much, especially in regulated industries like healthcare, the impact would have been would have been significant. But to your question about how this impacted just overall support and security, I think the biggest thing was just a lot of our security controls are, are predicated around knowing where a user comes from, the, this concept of implicit trust. So you have a network that is trusted, you have a device that is trusted, mm -hmm. you have a, a certain sort of predictable work pattern. You know, Johnny F logs in at eight o'clock in the morning and usually logs off at about 6 p.m. at night. Well, COVID blew all of that away. You know, we you have people working from home, you know, sharing computers, one minute, you know, your kid is doing his um, schoolwork on that PC. The next minute, you're you're logging on to a secure meeting using that same PC. Uh, people are working from wherever, whatever network they're able to connect to. We know across the country, um, most ISPs were overwhelmed with the traffic. Uh, people were logging on from their home broadband provider and then maybe hopping off to a cell phone provider or cell tower. So being able to keep track of who was logging into what and is this endpoint, is this individual still trusted? I think that's the biggest challenge that we've had over the last over the last 12 months keeping up with a remote workforce. And also people are used to the convenience of, you know, walking up to the IT help desk and asking for assistance. Uh, now, all of a sudden, everyone is, you know, having to set up their, their workstation at home and people are plugging in monitors who have never plugged in a monitor into a computer, for instance. <laughs> so everything from the really complex to the really simple stuff, we've had to work across that entire, um, you know, um, scope. So how does ExtraHop and network detection response actually help give you some of that visibility to identify that implicit trust, right? Because that 
you know, a lot of that is coming through network connections, whether it's coming through a VPN or not through a VPN or different devices. H- how did ExtraHop help solve some of that complexity for you? Well, the, the very first thing that we do with ExtraHop is just the ability to identify the assets. You know, ExtraHop, like um, most good NDR tools, not only gives you visibility into what's coming into your network, but ExtraHop actually does one better. It classifies these assets based on historical information that it has around these types of assets and what they do. So I can tell, you know, that's a computer. Well, that's the first thing in security, identifying what you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Well, I can tell that that's an IoT device or a device that I've never seen before. And that then prompts one of you know our analysts to then take action, to then investigate further and you know see if that's really worth a, a second or a third look or if it's not, they can just acknowledge it and then they can move on. So the ability to see across the the vast majority of what's going on across your estates, the ability to identify what type of device it is and if the behavior of that device is normal or not is critical. Right? It allows you to sift through potentially millions of alerts and get down to the alerts that you should be um, you should be concerned with. Yeah, and that, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, historically, we were inundated as security teams with so much data. And, and you know, a platform like ExtraHop kind of lets you um, weed through the noise, right? It, it, all of that aggregated data that's coming in was, was overwhelming on, on analysts. So, so now you have a tool um, that you can get visibility into not only every device, but the services running on those devices, right? And, and, and really be able to uh, profile, uh, you know, intelligently because you're getting yeah. all that level of context. Absolutely. And in addition to that, and you really touched on a, on a key point, which is some most people listening to this may think, well, what's the whole premise of NDR versus all the other tools? And of course, in, in security and IT generally, there's no shortage of these different buckets mm-hmm. that we, we tend to put um, products into. And prior to the, the NDR revolution, a lot of us had SIM technology. And SIM technologies are great, right? They give you that elusive single pane of glass where you're able to pull um, you know, all of the, the different logs and aggregate them into one single correlated view that you can then track what's going on within your environment. But a lot of um, SIM technology allow you to look backwards. You, you allow you to see things after the fact, almost a tool that you can use to investigate what's mm-hmm. happened on your network. And in some cases, a lot of people put in technology like that really for compliance reasons, not for day-to-day operational uh, benefit. But an NDR gives you a little bit of both, right? It allows you to do um, some look back. So with Extra Hub, for instance, you can go looking back up to 90 days. But the idea is not just to look back. The idea is to proactively prevent things from happening across your network. So if configured correctly, it allows you to see the traffic that's coming in. And if it's flagged as you know, a traffic that is malicious or um, anom- you know, an anomaly that requires further investigation, you can actually integrate with um, um, SOAR technologies mm-hmm. or response solutions that are able to take simple actions like block the traffic or um, allow connection, but only allow connection to, say, an internet-facing zone or a zone mm-hmm. that has no, no um, um, confidential or, you know, it's not a secure area within your network. So you can take a lot of of um, proactive actions that uh, we would normally not be able to take till after the fact. Yeah, that's a challenge. I mean, especially when you have what 800 different sites, mm-hmm. do you treat each of those sites like its own network segment so that you have the ability to control traffic in and out of each of those locations? Because you want to you want to make sure there's no crossover across some of these sites as well, right? Absolutely. And that's, that's pretty, you pretty much just summed up what our business model is. Each of those um, dental offices is a unique entity. So mm-hmm. I mentioned 830 plus offices. Um, for to us, each of those offices, we have a relationship with directly. We protect the network. The network is air gapped from the office next to them. And if a patient, for instance, needs to go from one office to the other, we can, and then you know, they can, and we're able to allow um, a patient, um, you know, the data migrates with them to the offices. But office A doesn't have access mm-hmm. to office B. Of course, everything is connected on the back end. So we need to make sure that we are tightly integrated. 
so that we don't create this data silos across across the estate and your data is your data and so you're able to migrate with the data but then at the same time we want to put in uh, sort of data diodes so that if you know an infection a compromise on, on one site doesn't then translate or you know um, transmits to the rest of the infrastructure and so having to be able to flip the switch um, to enable speed and yet you know mm-hmm. enforce um, privacy and security controls that's that's another key balancing act that we have to we have to go through every day yeah so in essence you've created a, a multi-tenant domain separated managed service for the dental industry that's that's pretty amazing essentially that's awesome. yeah <laughs> yeah that's sometimes awesome. we internally we call it the hub and spoke model right yep, you yep. know we we're that hub in the middle and everything mm-hmm. connects out of it but yep. it's all so tightly interconnected sure. but everything can be traced from source to destination yeah. as a unique um, entity um, if you like so that creates, I think, would create some interesting challenges from a deployment mechanism, wouldn't it? I mean, you've you've got to deploy hardware or sensors out to these different environments. H- how does that deployment work, and how does it look with ExtraHop versus some of the other solutions you were looking at? Because you, this could get pretty complex deploying to, to hundreds of sites, right? Oh, yeah, it is. And, you know, initially when we started with, with Extra Help, we deployed in just our core data centers and our, and our core cloud uh, tenants full for that reason. And we're in the process of looking at um, uh, moving to virtual sensors within our dental offices so we can leverage the infrastructure that already already exists. So if you think about this sort of hierarchy um, or hierarchical architecture, where you deploy as much as you can at the core, being the data center, and obviously our cloud tenants like AWS. Mm -hmm. And then we have more regional pops. And then now we're moving that down into the local um, level so that each office essentially has a virtual sensor that identifies that office as a unique entity. But then you then aggregate at the enterprise layer, you can see everything. So you can track, are we seeing a, a, let's say, command and control IP address show up in office 11 and we're seeing the same type of Mm -hmm. uh, traffic pattern in office 22 right is there something a little bit more coordinated going on or is this just uh just a one-off and you can start seeing different patterns of behavior happen across those offices but you do have um to your point paul you do have to maintain that infrastructure and luckily with the various deployment models available you can have a small appliance which I find a little bit tedious to have yet another infrastructure appliance Mm -hmm. in an office. So the virtual sensor approach um, is the preferred approach for us. That's interesting. Yeah, that way you don't have to worry about actually shipping an appliance out to to get that visibility. And because you're integrated at the core, when you see these anomalies affecting multiple sites, I'm assuming that you have a little more central control than worrying about each site as an individual connection then, right? Because if I have the, the, the rule sets more at the core, a, a single rule change could protect potentially all your remote sites. Yeah, that's and that's the key. Um, the the ability to deploy quickly um, using a centralized rule set, centralized policy manager. Um, those changes. Uh, there are a few um, key points um, to go into some of the detail. We obviously have our our core um, data center firewall. We have the firewalls within the dental offices, and then we also have the SD WAN appliances. Mm-hmm. Those for the at the infrastructure layer, those are the three main choke points, and we're able to deploy policies, you know, single policies across those um, three um, um, areas to take effect across the organization, pretty much, a, you know, drop of the hat. And then going beyond that, if there is something that was say um, found that was affecting endpoints using our endpoint solution. We're also able to um, push out a policy that will then take action on either an individual endpoint or across all the endpoints connected and reporting across our estate. And then the final point is on top of our SD-WAN um, device or um, technology, we have another layer of, um, I guess it's easier to just mention some of the, the tools that, that we use. We use um, VeloCloud for SD-WAN, we use um, Palo Alto for uh, firewalls as well as um, uh, Prisma access. So we're able to push those firewall policies from the data center to the branch offices using Prisma access. So across the board, if we validate that something is indeed malicious, 
or in some cases we have autonomous responses where the system is able to alert um, in this case Palo Alto wildfire to make a rule change based on you know the verdict that was reached by one of the NDR solutions that we have in place and we're able to take action seamlessly and also have an analyst going after the fact to review and say yes that's indeed a um, the valid response or if not then we're able to override that response thankfully you know we don't have those situations crop up um, hardly ever but if you do right no system is is um, beyond failing once once a while we have the ability to um, have a human analyst in, intercept the process and and make a, a different determination yeah, I mean, that's a pretty streamlined architecture when you think about it, right? And I mean, if you think about the average, what, 50, 60 potential security tools in the environment, I mean, you've really boiled it down to more like a handful of kind of like the key technologies when they're mm -hmm. integrated together, you know, your NDR providing your asset data, providing uh, behavior data, looking for anomalies, and then coordinated with these other solutions, your firewalls, your endpoints. I mean, yeah. you streamlined a lot of the complexity in your tool sets, which I don't know that a lot of other organizations have, have been able to succeed at. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. mean, complexity in tool sets and architecture, right? Because I mean, in the beginning of the conversation, you let it, we're a cloud first organization. You said that, right? With some on prep. Yeah. So you are, you know, the case study of, of this hybrid approach, right? Because I'm sure you have applications applications in the cloud, infrastructure in the cloud, you're talking about SD-WAN, but you have all of that on-prem as well. So being able to have, you know, I, 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 I collaborate a lot with our business intelligence team because data is very important to, to us as a security team, right? And, and yeah. I'm almost seeing um, security teams building out these like data lakes, right? And and, yeah. and that's kind of where extra hop comes into play here. They're building you yeah. this data lake of, of of context between your your cloud environment, your on prem environment, your endpoint, you know, your folks working from home. So I think that that you know that that being able to have that platform that can bring all of that intelligence together for you. And hey, by the way, you know, have have the ability to automate a lot of that traditional analyst activity, right? That was weeding through a lot of logs and re weeding through a lot of information um, that was that was noise. I, I think having that economy of scale is huge for organizations these days. And I agree. I think you, you mentioned two key things and I just want to play back there. I'll start with the second one, which is automating what the analyst does. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of times when we talk about NDR, and I think between all of us, we, we maybe deserve an award for talking about NDR for 20 minutes and not mentioning AI, ML, or deep learning. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to jinx that and I'm going to mention that, you know, and in the security profession, a lot of people, you know, we're almost in two groups. There's the group that kind of embraces it, and then there's the other part that kind of hates it, partly because of the way the marketing folks have, have gone mm -hmm. about selling it, almost as though you know, AI and ML will replace the human analyst. And I, and I think it doesn't. They really can coexist. But, you know, we all have good days and bad days. And this is how I explain AI and, and, and ML, right? Whether you're using scripted learning or unscripted learning or supervised and supervised, it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, you have the ability to tune the tool sets mm -hmm. that you're using to the point where you can say beyond reasonable doubt that if you see these series of actions, these indicators of compromise, that there is a more than likely chance that you're being attacked or you're having, uh, you know, you have ransomware or whatever on your network. All that these technologies really do is they take that, they bottle that together, and then essentially you set and you forget it to the point that if you see anything that kind of trips those sensors or those wires or, you know, those IOCs, it is able to respond. And the problem with humans is as smart as we are, we are not consistent. We're not always available. <laughs> and that's where what these tools give you. They give you that consistency of response. They give you that predict, uh, predictability. They give you speed, right? They don't have an off day. And I think security organizations across the world, and indeed just general IT, if you're able to just grab the concept of this is going to help you perform at your best, because you are helping the tool at your very best with you know a bunch of others in the room, mm -hmm. tuning and managing the systems to the point where you have that response capability going forward. That's the that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, you know, we've never had a problem in IT generally with 
um, logs. I mean, from the very onset, everything generates a log. In fact, we get so overwhelmed with logs and most of us just farm them off and never really look at them till something happens and then we're, we're trying to pause through the logs. And, and then we realized cool. we didn't yeah. co collect the right logs. <laughs> we didn't collect the right logs, or we, right. we overrode too quickly, right? <laughs> but what this allows us to do is that concept of a data lake. Just take yeah. all the stuff that makes sense and put it in one place. Have the analytics engine on top of that that is able to sift through the logs mm -hmm. really at the speed of cloud or you know, throwing a, <laughs> a marketing line there. <laughs> and it allows you to pass through the logs, hopefully, hopefully in a, with a single pane of glass across the various domains of your of your infrastructure whether mm -hmm. that's endpoint user networks cloud really doesn't matter that's what we're looking for and as people work through their tech stack if i you know leave you with one thing today is all of these tools now integrate most of them integrate you know seamlessly out of the box rather than thinking about you know, just layering on more tools think rather how you can integrate and get to as close to a single visibility um, point of truth across your estate that would speed up your ability to respond and increase the efficacy of your response um, considerably. Yeah, and that, that's a great point. I mean, these tools aren't built to replace the humans. It's to put the humans in a place where they can add more value to the business, mm -hmm. right? Instead of all that monotonous work. Yep. Right. Yeah. It, and when we're dealing with network packets and we're dealing with logs, we're talking lots of volume, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's, you know, you, you don't scale the people. If you're using efficient tools, you can take some of that burden off of your people resources and, and definitely get more value out of them. But, I mean, we're talking about high volume systems here when we're talking about network packets mm -hmm. and logs, for example. That's true. You've got a lot of a lot of volume and then you add to that one of the core capabilities, um, I, I would say one of the unique differentiations that ExtraHub brings to the table is the ability to decrypt those logs at scale. You know, when, when encryption came on the scene many years ago, it was so that we could, you know, as professionals or you know, organizations, we could um, encrypt the traffic and prevent it from, from being intercepted or being decrypted by the folks that we didn't want to have access to it. Well, that's just completely flipped in his head. And now um, the bad guys are using th that same technology. And depending on what reports you, you read, um, anywhere from 60 to 75 plus percent of all the traffic that we're seeing across our enterprise today is encrypted. And so you have the, the issue of the volume of logs that you're dealing with. And you now have this other additional problem of the bulk of that volume being encrypted. And so if you don't have the ability to decrypt a scale, then you're essentially um, only focusing your efforts on a slice of the pie and not the whole picture. And that doesn't serve a lot of, of uh, purpose or doesn't really add value if you're not able to see across your entire landscape. Obviously, there are um, ethical and privacy and confidentiality issues that you have to go through and work through with your legal counsel. Um, if you're going to go down the path of decryption, you've got to be clear in, mm -hmm. in what data you decrypt, what uh, forms a, a valid exception. Um, those things are obviously areas that you need to consider before you just hit the magic button and decrypt all the traffic that is that's um, going through your network. So just a word of caution there. No, I think that's great advice, right? If I need visibility, I better make sure I have visibility into all the traffic yeah. and not just like 35% of it to, to yeah. on your on your numbers, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Nemi, thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Appreciate the invite. Thank you. Um, and um, look forward to next time. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. To learn more about how network detection and response can help solve your complex cybersecurity challenges, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash extra hop. We're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. <laughs> 